Well, I'm Reg Hart in Toronto, Canada, talking to you from the Cineforum, the Public Enemy. Those are two of the names that I use here. Cine means cinema. Forum, a forum is a platform for ideas. I was told by my high school principal that I had the wrong attitude and that if I left school that day, I would starve in two weeks. Then he said, I haven't given you permission to leave. Where do you think you're going? And I said, I'm going to see if you were right. Now that was a long time ago. I'm 77 and that was when I was 17. So that's a long time ago and clearly I'm still kicking. And kicking is the important word here, kicking. Now, if you Google my name, you'll find out that I'm somebody the world knows about. You'll also find out that there have been people doing their best to do me harm. Well, let them. I'm a big guy. I can handle it. This is 2024. And on January 1st, 2024, Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse entered the public domain. Now, only the 1928 version of Mickey Mouse is public domain. Next year, the 1929 version will be followed by the 1930, the 1931. But the only ones that really matter are the ones between 1928 in 1930, because after 1930, Mickey got spanked. He had to stop being a guy full of Mickey and start being a mouse that was well behaved. And you all know what that means. That means that uh, he became a churchgoer and if he wanted to drink, he had to do it on the QT because he couldn't drink anymore in public. If you look at those early cartoons, he does a lot of stuff that he couldn't do later on. Why did he get spanked? because mamas and papas, mostly mamas, found out what a rascal Mickey actually was, and they complained, and they complained loud to censor boards and elsewhere, and Mickey had to start being a good little mouse. That was the end of his career. Everything after 1930 is like Mickey Mouse after the invasion of the body snatchers. He looks like Mickey, he acts like Mickey, but something elemental, the Mickey, is missing. Now, the word Mickey has several meanings. One is something you put in a drink to dope somebody. But when you put the Mickey into someone or something, you make it vibrant, you make it bright, you make it radiant, you make it brilliant. And we've had some really awful years. And I'd like to see the Mickey put into 2024. Now, some folks will tell you that Walt Disney didn't create Mickey Mouse. That's 100% not true. Now, he didn't draw the first Mickey Mouse cartoons. That's true. Those were drawn and animated by a man named Obi Works. But Mickey came from Walt. And here's what had happened. Disney had a very successful series he had created for Universal Pictures Carl Lemley was the head of Universal Pictures. He wanted a cartoon. And Mickey came up with Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And these were being produced by a man named Charles Mintz, who had married Margaret Winkler. Margaret Winkler was the first person really interested in animated cartoons. She released the cartoons created by Paul Terry and a whole bunch of other people. And she was a, a, a force, and she released Disney's first cartoon series, Alice in Cartoon Land. This was a variation on Max Fleischer's series, Coco the Clown, where Coco was an animated character in the live action real world. Well, Disney put a live girl into an animated world, and that was what he did. He basically borrowed, ripped off, stole. We all start off by copying, so there's no shame in that. But Alice had worn out her welcome, and they needed something fresh. And they came up with that rabbit, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And Oswald was a hit. 
Now, Mr. Mitz was a man who cut every corner he could, and he was forcing Walt to produce these films just as cheaply as they could be produced, and Walt knocked every penny off the budget that could be knocked off it. But, you know, it was successful, and he took a chance. He thought, well, I'm successful. I can afford to get married. And he married the woman of his dreams, who happened to be his secretary. And they, he brought her to New York with him to renew the Oswald contracts. He walked in, oh, wow, look, here's Mr. Mintz. Isn't he a wonderful man? And Mr. Mintz said to Disney, you got to make these pictures for less money. Can't do it. Can't do it, said Walt. I can do it, said Mintz. How, said Walt. He says, I don't need you. I hired all your artists. And he had hired all of Disney's artists except one, and that one was Ubai Works. Now, I brought Frizz Frilling to Toronto. I'm not Leonard Malton, and I'm not Jerry Beck, and you'd be glad I'm not because those are nice people, but that's about the best you can say of them. They're living in New York, they're living in Hollywood, they can go and access these people, just go knock on the door or give them a call, come on over to my event. When I brought Frizz Frilling to Toronto, I had to do it with my dime and I don't have a dime. And I flew him up Air Canada first class and I put him up at the Royal York Hotel, which is one of the finest hotels in Toronto. And I had him here not for one night, but for three days. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And when I invited Mr. Fritting to come to Toronto, I said, would you care for a fee? And he said, can I bring my wife? And I thought, what kind of question is that? Who says, leave the wife at home? I said, of course you can bring the wife. And Mr. Fritting said to me, in that case, there's no fee. I found out afterwards that the colleges and the universities and the schools and the libraries and the cinematheques and the museums and the art galleries and the forums would say, we haven't got enough money in our budget and, uh, you know, we can't afford the wife and can you please fly standby? And uh, I know because I got invited to an animation festival and they wanted me to fly standby and I said, I'm not standing by anything. Get me a seat. They go, none of the other artists are like you. I said, well, they ought to be. And the lady from the embassy that was talking putting me in touch with these people after the call said, artists get fed from the last teat on the bull. I said, what? She said, you've never heard that before. I said, no, I haven't. She said, well, bulls don't give milk. So when an artist drinks from the last teat on the bull, they're drinking from a particularly dry well. Now, here's the deal. I had a non-profit company, seemed to be a smart thing. Everybody was doing it. And everybody locally in Toronto in animation, pretty high hat people, they'd stand outside of my programs giving information on their programs, but even when it was raining, they wouldn't come inside because they don't like me. So if you talk to the animation community in Toronto, you'll find out that most of them don't like me. And that's fine by me. There they go. Let them go and do what they're doing. But anyway, they all told me that Frizz Freeling was old hat and he couldn't teach them anything. Now, here's a man who got five Academy Awards and he was running his own studio and he was still working in his old age. And he couldn't teach them anything. Well, some people, you can't teach anything and they're the ones you can't teach anything to. So there you go. So anyway, they wanted me to call Mr. Freeling and cancel the event because it looked like it was going to tank, be nobody coming out. They were real loud about how he had no value for them. So I have to go and pick up the phone and I go pick up the phone. But before I can push a button or dial, it's him. He says, hi, Reg, this is Frizz. The Patty Freeling has folded. I'm back at Warner Brothers. They don't want me going anywhere they don't approve of, and they don't approve of you. And my first thought was, gee, I'm off the hook. I'm not going to lose face here. All I got to do is say, gee, Frizz, that's too bad. Hang up. He's going to feel like Murd. I'm going to be okay. He's not going to be the wiser. They're all going to be happy. I'm not going to lose face. But I'm Irish, and Mr. Freeling is Jewish. And if you're smart, you don't pick a fight with an Irishman or a Jew. And I said, well, how do you feel about it? 
He said, well, I gave you my word and my wife's looking forward to the trip. I said, then I guess you're coming. And he came. And my board said, we can't talk to you. And they got up and they marched out. And goodbye and good riddance. Well, I let Air Canada know that Frizz was the creator of the Pink Panther, one of the key animation directors on Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Porky Pig, Elmer Fudd, Tweety, Sylvester, the whole nine yards. And this was before 9-11 and he's flying first class. And they put Frizz in the captain's seat of the plane when it landed in Toronto. And the place was packed because the Pink Panther was still hot. I mean, I went down to New York and had a long talk with the head lawyer for Warner Brothers, and I learned that Warner Brothers was owned by a funeral home around the corner from his office. And uh, he said, you, 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 you've advertised cartoons on your poster. You don't have the right, you, don't, you didn't rent them from us. You don't have the right to advertise them. I said, I don't even have those cartoons. Those are his credits. Those are the cartoons he got Academy Awards for. He didn't even know. They didn't even know the man had won five Academy Awards, and those were the pictures he'd won them for. He says, oh, I'm sorry. I said, Mr. Frilling is a director. As far as I'm concerned, he's the director of the event, whatever he says goes. He says, okay, okay, okay. We, we, we don't have a problem. You can bring him to Toronto. And he came. And he walked out that first night and the place was packed. No interest in him, huh? Packed. He said, I'm not going to talk for more than a half hour. Well, I can talk to you more about it later when you meet me. But he talked for several hours and he walked out ready to talk for more. He said, you're doing something incredible here. And he was here for three days and he had a wonderful time. His wife had a wonderful time. And I got him filmed. And one of the few real videos where Frizz talks about his work is the one he did with me here in Toronto. And you can check it out for yourself. And that Christmas when I called him, Frizz said to me, you're the finest host I ever met. Like I said, I'm not Jerry Beck. I'm not Leonard Malton. Well, Frizz told me, he's one of the ones that left Walt, he said, we all thought Walt was going to go broke, and he fooled us by going broke in reverse. So here is Walt Disney in New York with his brand new bride, and he just discovered that he is totally mucked. Mucked, mucked, mucked. He is up the creek without a paddle. He hasn't got a pot to piss in. And the life that was full of joy is now full of nothing but disaster. And there he is on the train on the way back to Hollywood. It's a long, lonesome ride with that bride of his. And he's freaking out because it means he's going to have to start all over from the bottom with kids that could barely draw their ass. And he's fiddling with the change in his pockets, and he came up with the idea to conjure up a character that could be drawn with a penny, a nickel, a dime, a quarter, and a 50-cent piece. All circles and lines. Circles and lines. Now, Jay Ward in the 1950s had the same problem when he was trying to get Rocky and Bullwinkle produced. The sponsor that offered to back his series insisted on the films being animated in a brand new studio in Mexico by brand new animation artists, most of whom couldn't draw and a few of whom couldn't even sign their name. And what did Jay Ward do? He goes, he go, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that. No, he sat down and he conjured up characters that could be drawn by people who couldn't draw. And that was his brilliance. Keep it simple, stupid. And you look at that first Mickey Steamboat Willie, and it's rough, and it's crude, and it is wonderful. So Walt does three of these things. They're silent pictures. While silent isn't going to sound stand out, he needs something new to offer. So he got the idea to put a soundtrack on the third one, Steamboat Willie. 
and they went to New York to record the sound. They had got every penny they could to do it, and the man who was in charge of the orchestra thought, well, he's just some hick farmer's son. What does he know? Ignored Walt completely, and what he did was, a, we've all been there, who were, you know, hick farmer's sons or country people. And what he gave Walt was just, you couldn't use it for love or money. It was just a complete waste of time. He's proud of it, though. And Walt had to conjure up the money. And this time, he got it done the way he wanted it. Now, some people say, well, he didn't produce the first sound on film cartoon. No, that's true. He didn't produce the first sound on film cartoon. But he did produce the first sound on film cartoon with pizzazz. And he showed it to people in New York. And they all looked at it and said, nobody comes out for a cartoon. It's just a short film. I don't want it. But, but, he talked to Samuel Rothfell, better known as Roxy. He owned the Roxy Theater, he owned the Colony Theater, and Roxy said to Walt Disney, I can pack my theater with your cartoon if you give it to me. And Roxy mounted a huge ad campaign advertising the cartoon. That's all, the cartoon. And people, those theaters were huge. They set thousands. People came out in the thousands and they walked out going, wow, I love that mouse. And because of the wave that Samuel Rothfell Roxy set in motion, it was a tsunami. It washed around the world and there was a big demand for Mickey Mouse. And that demand lasted until 1930. And then Mickey got spanked. And that was the end of Mickey. Then we got the invasion of the body snatchers version of Mickey. Now here's the deal. Walt Disney designed Mickey Mouse to be animated by young men who were looking for work. And they'd take any job, no matter how low it paid, so long it was, it was a job. Because they would be desperate, just as he was desperate. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give to the young person between the age of 18 and 20 who conjures up the best Mickey Mouse cartoon that I see in 2024. I'm going to give you a script. I don't want what you to do to be longer than seven minutes. And I'm going to own all of the stuff you send me. So remember that. This is my idea. This is my idea. I'm going to own what you produce. But if you do a good job, I'm going to put you to work. I don't want anyone that's gone to art school. I don't want anyone animating in the business. I don't want anyone who's gone to Sheridan College or any other animation school on earth. Why? Because everything they teach you is wrong. I had a young man who a friend of mine living with me said, my friend is homeless. Can we get him in? I said, sure. So we moved him in off the street. And he said to me, what's the best thing to do to pursue a career in animation? I said, for Christ's sake, stay as far away as you can from animation colleges and schools. Go out and find a studio that's hiring and learn on the job. And he went out and he came back that afternoon at noon with a job. And I said, where are you working? And he told me. I said, you're at the best place in town. And a couple of weeks later, I ran into his boss and I told him what I told him. Stay away from animation schools. Stay away from animation colleges. He goes, that was excellent advice. I said, yeah, he took it. I told him to find a studio that was hiring and get in there. 
and they would train him on, on the job. And he said, that's excellent advice. I said, yeah, he took it. He got a job at the best place in Toronto. He goes, where's that? I said, your place. He said, who is it? And I told him, he said, God damn it, that kid is good. God damn it, that kid is good. You got a gift. Every one of you listening to me right now has a gift. And if your gift is left alone to grow, it's going to grow into a magnificent tree and give shelter for your family. But if you go to animation school, they're going to prune all your branches and make you look like something pretty they can put on their lawn, and you're going to be useless, 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 useless. Quite frankly, there's no one at the Disney Animation Studio that I would consider hiring. And there's no one at DreamWorks either, all right? There's no one working in this industry that I would consider hiring. I don't even want them at my table. Now, if you got the fire in your belly that says, I'm better than Ubi Works, ever was on his best day, then you get in touch with me and we'll conjure up something wonderful. It will make 2024 the year of Mickey Mouse because we'll post all of these cartoons, all of them, not just the ones that I like the best, but we'll put them all up on YouTube for the world to see. We'll make 2024 the year of the 1928 Mickey Mouse. And that will put a lot of Mickey into 2024. Reg Hart in Toronto. God bless. <laughs> Who's the leader of us all? M-I-C-K-E-Y. Mickey Mouse.
Thank <laughs> you.